You're listening to the BBM Global Network with 25 years in broadcast audio and video production. Our passionate team creates content and marketing for the world of Internet talk radio. If you've got a passion, come join us at BBMGlobalNetwork.com. The BBM Global Network. Your voice is now heard. to Unlocked with your host, Madeline Blair. In 2020, the issues are multiple, economic, health, and social. Unlocked is about this moment, the now. It's about opening possibilities so that you can begin to take back control of your life. We all can be overwhelmed with anxiety and ambiguity. So please welcome Madeline Blair and listen as she will help you feel a new sense of ease and empowerment. I'm your host, Madeline Blair. Unlocked is about strategies for you to prepare for and handle today's challenges for your career and your life. Building on my book, Unlocked, Discover How to Embrace the Unexpected, we explore the dimensions that create more resilience, greater learning, enhanced effectiveness for yourself, your employees, and even your children. We're going to explore today's challenges and uncertainties and how to prepare for dealing with them. That's why we say it's Unlocked, Opening Possibilities. On our show, questions about the topics are welcome. If you have a question, feel free to call to 866-451-1451 and the engineer will queue you up. If you prefer not to call in, send me your questions via email to madeline at madelineblair.com. I'll be sure to read your emails and make certain that your question is tackled on next week's show. I love hearing what's on your mind and happy to respond. And lastly, of course, I always invite you to visit my website, MadelineBlair.com. So let's start opening things up. Twyla Tharp, the famous dancer and choreographer, said, Creativity is more about taking the facts fictions and feelings we store away and finding new ways to connect them. What we're talking about here is metaphor. Metaphor is the lifeblood of all art. Now, one of my favorite books is by Twyla Tharp called The Creative Habit. Every page seems to add to my sense of wonder at her creativity. Throughout the book, She offers exercises that can help the reader tap into their creativity, provided, of course, that they do the exercise. And one of the exercises is called the egg. Now, if you can, close your eyes and imagine this magnificent dancer sitting on the floor. She sits there and she pulls her knees up and her legs and she tucks them into her body. Her arms wrap around her knees and her head gets tucked down toward her knees she becomes the egg and from here she imagines taking one movement to see how she can change the egg for example if she raises her head and straightens her back she becomes tall egg can you see it in your mind's eye you know as a dancer it makes sense for her to use her body's movements and positions to inspire her but I found that I it, that it also awakened in me a desire to experiment that didn't leave me after I got up from the floor. It was a safe exercise that invited me to try less safe things, such as writing an edgy blog, or in the design of a day-long virtual class, I actually inserted two-minute videos. Instead of quoting celebrities, I had the celebrities say them. The exercise made me tap into my memories, finding new ways to connect. It made me more creative. Recently, I was introduced to the book called Myth, Magic, and Metaphor, A Journey into the Heart of Creativity. 
the author explores creativity across several dimensions. Today, we have the pleasure of talking with that author who has said things like, there are no rules in creativity. But here's another one I just love. She says, the reader has to participate. Now, she's referring to the reader of a book, but I can imagine it being the same if the audience is a listener of words or perhaps of music or a viewer of dance or sculpture or a taster of great foods or maybe a nose as a perfumer is referred to. But regardless of the medium or sense that is being used, how does that how does that reader participate? I want you to remember that question. I will be exploring creativity today with my guest, Dr. Patricia Daly Leip. Patricia has written 10 books. One of them, La Jolla, A Celebration of Its Past, won the 2002 San Diego Book Awards. Another, reissued in 2010, A Cruel Calm, Paris Between the Wars. It received first prize for historical fiction in 2013 from the Royal Dragonfly Book Awards. She was awarded top author of the decade, 2021, by the International Association of Top Professionals. Patricia, I am so excited to have you with me today. Welcome to Unlocked. Thank you. I'm honored to be on. Ah, The honor is both ways, then. Okay. Uh, listen, I, <laughs> I rarely focus on a particular book when I interview guests, but I loved the title of your book, Myth, Magic, and Metaphor. So that, it, it just became natural to call our conversation by the same name, uh, as we're going to be talking about creativity. Why should we, however, why should we talk about creativity from your perspective? I think it's it's extremely important in today, you know, in post 9-11, as I wrote, I can actually, let me quote something here, which is apropos, because it's, it's very important today um, that we, despite our differences of opinion and race and creed and nationality, we need to not lose sight of one fact. We're all human beings, right? Mm-hmm. And share this planet, you know, and... The scope of our environment, um, you know, from the stars and beyond is immeasurable. But within each of us, there's a bright light waiting to be released in each of us. And this light has no limits. It has no structure. It's called creativity. (sighs) And it lurks within us all. You know, it's there. And this is the beauty of being human. And this is really important to share and to unlock and I I want to quote what the president said. He let me write this years ago when he was vice president, but Joe Biden said, quote, the arts are bound to inspire imagination and creativity and awaken in scores of young people a yearning and talent many don't know resides in them. And, you know, in this day and age, everybody wants an answer. Everybody wants, they want, ask the question and get an answer. There aren't answers necessarily. A question might provoke another question, might provoke another question, and it goes on and on. And it opens your brain to new ideas. And there's so many examples of that, you know. Uh, This is what we need to get out of, you know, I have to have an answer. Uh, I love that shift from let's not talk about answers. Let's talk about what we can create from this wonderful, I love that bright light within us. Uh, that's fabulous. Yeah, and, and, you know, and to paraphrase what St. Thomas said, he said, the more I know, the more I know how little I know. <laughs> and that's yes. the beauty of it, you know. It, that's the beauty of creativity is allowing yourself to expand and and yeah. give yourself permission. You know, don't have to say, I have to have it right. And that's the other part of being a teacher. Instead of teaching You need to inspire the students to learn. And the same goes with writing. You're trying to inspire the reader to expand their understanding and open up another little loophole or another little cubbyhole that's in their brain that they hadn't thought about. That's what creativity is all about. It's a beautiful thing. 
Oh, absolutely. You know, when you we talked about a teacher really being uh, her job or his job is to inspire. I so often when I open a class say to the t- students, I cannot learn for you. All I can do is offer you the opportunity to learn so, so that I help there them you go. see. There you go. Doing it right. <laughs> <laughs> That the, the, the initiative has to come from them. Yeah, I, you know, I, I, I'm I'm curious, and and I think our audience is too, to just get a sense of who a little bit more about who you are. Obviously, you've done so many wonderful things, but tell us a bit about your life and what led you to become such a prolific writer. Well, um, I was uh, at the Bishop School in La Jolla, California in seventh grade, and there's a, they had a, a paper called Saharika, sees all, hears all, thinks it, knows all, Saharika. <laughs> and I wrote for Saharika, and that was my first writing, and I loved it. And I thought, oh, wow, you know, look what I can find out in the process of writing. And I went on to Vassar, and I wrote for the miscellaneous news in Vassar, and then I went to the Université Catholique de Louvain in Belgium, and studied philosophy and eventually moved down to Paris. And then from Paris, I moved to Rome and to meet my only living relative. My mother died when I was only 18. And so I wanted to meet my only living relative on my mother's side, who was my great uncle in Rome. <clears throat> and so as a result of all of that, I, I learned so much, you know, during this was in the 60s when it was safe to travel around as a, a female, single female by herself. And uh, I'm so glad that I had that opportunity. And then when I came back to the United States, uh, my first job was working for the Evening Star newspaper in Washington, D.C. And they had me answering the telephone and people were, you know, the reporters were on the spot and there was a fire or or some tragedy or some horror thing. And they would speak very quickly. And I couldn't understand them. Um, Yes, English is my first language, but I'd been speaking French and Italian for three years and and these reporters were speaking very quickly with southern accents and I had them repeat themselves well when you have a disaster in the background you don't want to repeat yourself <laughs> so what you do is you know you take that person out of the job so Evening Star said I'm sorry Patricia you can't have that job we've got another job for you and you know what that was what, what writing was obituary <laughs> Well, at least yeah, but there was that no opened rush. my mind to so many things. I met such wonderful families, and it was when Washington D.C. was segregated, and so I was a, I was given permission to go into areas that I didn't know at all and interview families that I wouldn't have known otherwise, and write about their lost loved ones. You know, and and I, I love meeting people, and I met all kinds of people from all walks of life, and wrote articles about whoever it was who had died in that family, and that was my first job. Wow, what a great way to get introduced to humanity in a from a totally different perspective. You know, before we go, I'm sorry, you were going to say something? No, go ahead. No, okay. <laughs> before we go any further, I want to go back to that question. I want to ask you your comments that the, the reader has to participate. What does that mean? You know, how can a reader uh. participate when reading a book? Okay. The participation is when when a writer writes, it's the process of writing. The product is a gift to the reader. And so the participation is, um, it's, how can I put it? Um, the, uh, James Joyce said, for example, the, 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 the substance of the essence or true substance of man consists in his being a conscious reactor against his uncertainty. And and about having any significance, and and it opens up what reading the participation is. The reader suddenly reads something, and it opens up maybe something in his mind that he hadn't thought about, and 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 that's how he participates. He he ends up expanding his own mind as a result of reading somebody else's experience, because we all have experiences, and they're all different in different parts, different walks of life. But the fact of, of reading someone else's experience and opening up that cubby hole in your mind might lead you, the reader, to think, gosh, you know, I didn't realize that that part of my life was important. She wrote about it. Well, maybe I can write about it. 
Or maybe you'll say something like, gee, I didn't know that that was something that was significant. That means I can go on and do it, be it music or painting or whatever. You know, it, it draws the reader into another aspect of their life that they might not have thought of until they read about it. Or in the case of history, the participation is the personal perspective, which I thought we were going to speak about at one point, you know, the personal perspective of history. And the reader reads from the personal perspective about an individual and they suddenly they feel like, gosh, you know, maybe, you know, if I was there, this is how I would feel or, or I'm beginning to feel what that person in the book is telling me. You know, like the book I wrote about my mother's life in Paris between the wars. It took 14 years to research that. And I got my PhD doing that research, but, you know, it put me in Paris between World War One and World War Two. And then when I wrote about it in that book, I'm hoping the reader will feel like they're going back into that period of time when Paris was the cultural capital of the world. You know, it's a participation of the reader is their, their being involved in whatever is being presented within the book and opening up their mind to a new... Um, attitude or aspect or environment does that make sense absolutely it does uh, because as you say you're reading along and just something strikes you like when i was talking about twyla tharp's book the egg well i would uh, an egg i actually grew up on an egg farm so eggs are really kind of part of my psyche but i never thought of <laughs> using that they never thought of that as as uh uh, something that you could do for yourself to grow your creativity. So for me, that was just as you say, a participation. Not because I did the exercise, but but because the name of it alone struck me as I have to think differently now. You know, there was another thing that you talked about just now uh, that that history. Uh, you, you understand history through the lives of others. You've said. History is biography, uh, and and I just love that phrase. But I I, I want to understand even more. Is there more you can say about that? Well, I can give you another quote that I love. Um, the history of every country begins in the heart of a man or a woman, and that was Willa Cather who said that. And and it's it's well. If, you know, Ambassador Dodd said in Germany in 1934, he said, if people knew the truth of history, they'd never be another great war. And if you can't learn from the past, you might repeat it. That's another quote. You know, um, the more we learn about the history, the, the less we, the more we might avoid another future catastrophe. That's, is that what we're talking about at this point? You know, is that what I'm you want? As, as you're speaking, I'm beginning to get a new understanding of what you meant by history is biography. You know, we often think of history as dates and places, uh, but in fact, it's really history is lived through the people. And, and well, so and when history, you, history really properly understood is actually, as Collingwood said, it's a history of thought. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's past and present combined. When, when, when a historian writes something about the past, like when I wrote about Paris between the wars, it was coming from where? It came from me. It came from my mind looking at the past. So it's a combination of past and present. And that's why it's, it's, it's personal. It's the history of, it's, it's, uh, you know, my major, my major was philosophy. It wasn't history. And so, you know, I had a terrible time at Vassar with history because the who, what, when, and where wasn't what was important to me. It was the why. Why did they do what they did when they did it? And the why comes from the perspective. And when I wrote the story about my great uncle William, I found out that he served the troops in World War One. He never told me about that. But I read his letters that he wrote to his sister, who was my grandmother, and they're in the archives at Georgetown University, and you read his letters, and you're in the war. You're reading what he wrote when he was right there in World War One as a priest with the troops, burying the dead. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's putting you there. It's the why that's behind. the. It's not the who, what, when, and where. It's the why. I was there, he said. I saw this, what he said. You know, and, and it was just, 
you know, it puts you there. And as the reader reading this, you feel like you're with him. Uh, it, you have once again opened my mind to something new. It, <laughs> history is not the who, what, and where. It's the why. Now, when you study history, I can remember the last time I studied history. I have to admit it. Is, I mean, studied it was in high school. And, of course, it was all about who, what, and where. When, in fact, what becomes really interesting to me now when I read historical novels or uh, history uh, it's always looking at why something happens. So you've articulated for me. So thank you for that insight. Well, and it's also history. You know, you can also realize it's not a crystal ball, and it gives us perspective. Mm-hmm. What it does, it opens our minds. You know, and it, and it, and it educates us. If we learn what they did in the past, hopefully we're not going to repeat it. Unfortunately, well, I won't go into that. But <laughs> but <laughs> history is philosophy. It's literature. It's sociology. It's anthropology. It's art, music. It's all that was said and done at a period of time. Mm-hmm. And and there are no answers. There's no absolute answers to history. It's it's perspective. It's looking according to your source of reference. You know, so if you're looking in terms of, you know, music or art, you know, that the artist portrays like the Impressionists, you know, what they were experiencing philosophically was expressed with Impressionism in their paintings. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. You know, in my own work on resilience, I see creativity. I say it's a sister to resilience. Uh, because to me, you can't be resilient unless you can see the step to move forward and decide to take it. Um, that really relates very much to how I see resilience, which is in that moment when you have to decide. So, Right, it, it's your ability sometime. to cope and respect yourself and to talk about and, and, and who you are and, and giving to others and being helpful for others, you know. That's what you're doing with your program, which is so beautiful, is you're helping others respect themselves and to give and understand, right? Well, thank you. Yes, well, I certainly try. But, you know, I I wonder if you'd comment, though, on that aspect of resilience and creativity, being sisters. Does that make sense to you? Uh, I'm trying to follow where you're going with this. (laughs) Creativity and... Re- resilience, the fact that with resilience. resilience you've got to Being make resilience. a difference. Yeah. Yes, because you have Can't to make, make a, a difference. Dis- well, what I tell people is very often, you know, as I said, it's, it's the the process is 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 it can be therapy. Writing is therapy. Painting is therapy. Music, any of these creative aspects are therapy. If you're if you're undergoing something, then get creative because the result of that is that you will feel better as a result because you're taking it from inside and putting it outside, either in words or in a painting or in music. And then for the person who receives or listens to or looks at or reads whatever you have accomplished, it will be a gift. So you're giving a gift while you're going through your own therapy. And so I tell people one of the best things to do is to, you know, write your memoir. That's important. Write it down. Write down what you're doing. But one of my books is All Alone, Washington to Rome. When I was, my mother died, I was all alone. I went to live in Europe. And what did I do? I wrote down what I was thinking at that time. And when I read what I was writing at that time, I, oh, wow, was that me? Well, yeah, it was because I wrote it down. <laughs> but it made me feel better at the time because I was all by myself in the world. And I was writing it down. I made me feel better, and I w- would meet with other people. And now, later, years later, I put it together in the book with these all these writings that I did at that time. And I look back and say, "Wow, you know, that's interesting. That's what I was going through." But I didn't. I didn't fall apart with it. I. I. I felt better as a result. And and I learned something later when I read what I wrote. Does that make any sense? Oh, yes, it does. You know, I I often, well, I often, in my book, I talk about one of the practices to help build your resilience is to write stories from your life. You know, it doesn't matter if it's from five minutes ago or from when you were five. 
The point is, those are the ingredients that make up your life. Those are the experiences that form you. And that if you do that, just as you did, you went back and you read those early things. If you read those stories that you write down, even though you maybe only wrote them over the last month or two months or whatever, you begin to see new aspects of yourself and you can you you become even a richer person just because you understand more about who you are yeah absolutely absolutely and you know the other part of it the other aspect of it is for the benefit of someone who might read it is that they will learn Again, we're talking about the personal perspective of history, but they will learn about a period of time, you know, that's, that's, that there's no other way to really feel it or understand it unless you read something that was written at that time. Yeah. Yeah, I, it reminds me of reading a, a, an essay by John Locke. Uh, it was really all about what's called commonplace books, written, I think, in the... I'm sure it was the 17th century. No, maybe it was the 16th century. Anyway, I, I, that I have to go back and, and confirm. But reading it was his reflections on how one thinks about learning and how you capture ideas and how you record them so that you can remember them. And I can tell you that transformed how I thought about personal knowledge management. People really do need to think about how they bring new understanding into their life, but then they have to figure out how they're going to remember it so that they can really use it, so to speak. And uh, and his his writing from, what, how many centuries ago – clicked in my mind and because it was and it it was funny was it it talked about alphabetization well you know to us we just tell our machine to alphabetize things well in that time you had to do it quite differently (laughs) and so you you found yourself laughing as you read it but in that laughter go ahead I have um, a quote from John Locke in my latest book, which is Miami's Yesteryears, It's Forgotten Founder, Locke, Tiffin, Heilemann, <laughs> another Locke. And it says, a taste of every form of knowledge is necessary to form the mind. That was the quote from John Locke. Wow. And I... whether he was related to us or not, I don't know, because the other Locke is my grandfather, and I don't know if his name came because of our ancestor being that John Locke or not. <laughs> well, you'll have to check that out. <laughs> you know, But my we, granddaughter now, is her first name is Locke. <laughs> oh, marvelous, marvelous. Yeah, but uh, I'm sorry, I, I just had to put that in because I heard you <laughs> quoting. <laughs> John Locke, yeah. Well, yeah. you know, we all grow up with the beliefs that only artists are creative, yet successful businesses are a reflection of their creativity and even of their employees' creativity. What do you think inspires Oh, absolutely. Them? You know, take the example of Einstein. You know, he had all the facts, and then he went to sleep one night, woke up in the morning, and he came up with the theory of relativity because he let his mind wander during the night in his dream. And that's what put all the facts together to create the, the theory of relativity. So, you know, it's it's the creativity that that pushes us forward, isn't it? Oh, indeed. In fact, when I talk about creativity and resilience, uh, I also often tag on innovation because those three things always seem to go together. Oh, yeah. Yep. Hmm. Well, you know, you have also said to let the words take over so that your yes. mind is opening to to listening to your heart. I want That's to, right. Talk a little bit about that. I just love that. Well, the etymology of the word create comes from the French word cœur. And it takes it takes courage, or not create, rather courage, and the cœur. I'm sorry, I had the wrong word. I was thinking creativity. But the, the courage, uh, the etymology of the word courage is cœur which is heart, and it does take courage to listen to your heart. And that's what creativity is all about. So it does take some courage to allow yourself to listen to your heart because everybody is used to having rules and regulations telling them how to do this and how to do that and feeling comfortable as long as they follow by the rules. But when you're listening to your heart, you're not following by any rules. 
uh, it, I love the direction that we're headed in because I want to pursue it a little bit more. But we need to take a commercial break right now. And when we come back, uh, I'm going to ask Patricia about that aspect of courage and and how she might reflect, the, how, how a mother might reflect that or express that to her children. So stay tuned and we'll be right back. Are you struggling to care for elderly parents or a spouse? Do you wonder if being a caregiver is making you sick? Are you worried about taking time off work to care for elderly parents and balance work, life, and caregiving? Has caregiving become exhausting and emotionally draining? Are you an aging adult who wants to remain independent, but you're not sure how? I'm Pamela D. Wilson. Join me for the Caring Generation radio show for caregivers and aging adults, Wednesday evenings, 6 Pacific, 7 Mountain, 8 Central, and 9 Eastern. Eastern, where I answer these questions and share tips for managing stress, family relationships, health, well-being, and more. Podcasts and transcripts of The Caring Generation are on my website, PamelaDWilson.com, plus my caregiving library, online caregiver support programs, and programs for corporations interested in supporting working caregivers. Help, hope, and support for caregivers is here on The Caring Generation and PamelaDWilson.com. The opiate epidemic has reached crisis levels, and with so many families affected by addiction, opiate-related drug overdoses, and death, the time is now to have a real constructive conversation about addiction that could lead to better prevention, treatment, and recovery. Alan Charles, author and keynote speaker on drug abuse and prevention, presents The Alan Charles Show. Alan brings a message of hope, sharing his unbelievable story of surviving a 24-year addiction to cocaine and highlights from his memoir, Walking Out the Other Side, an addict's journey from loneliness to life. His raw honesty and courageous heart breaks the stigma of addiction and offers a unique perspective into the mind of an addict. Join Alan each week as he brings his listeners to a true understanding of the grip of addiction. It is only with this understanding that we can begin to heal. The Alan Charles Show, Thursdays at 9 p.m. Eastern on the BBM Global Network. This is Madeline Blair. You're listening to Unlocked, brought to you live from Bold Brave Media Talk Network and TuneIn Radio. Today, we're listening to Dr. Patricia daly Leip, and she's been talking about creativity from her amazing book, Myth, Magic, and Metaphor. And when we closed this before the commercial break, uh, we were talking about how one could nurture creativity and the fact that that it comes from within. So, Patricia, I was wondering, how can a mother nurture creativity in her children? Well, we could start with notice a thing so a thing gets noticed. So you go out, you take a walk, you look around, you see, feel, smell, experience. That's what needs to be done with children they need to go outside and and enjoy you know you go to dinner at a restaurant and you see these kids looking at their cell phone at the dinner table that just breaks my heart you know this is not what it's all about being out there and realizing that we have this beautiful world around us i mean at night look at the sunset oh you know, we do that every night when we go out and take care of the horses. That we go out again at eight o'clock so that we can be there for the sunset. It's beautiful. Um, take time with your kids outside. Let them see, not just look, but see, and and to listen. Don't just hear something. Listen to it. Go out and feel it. You know, uh, even if it means just going barefoot on the grass you know, or touch the mildew that's on the leaves or whatever. Have the experience. Have the kids go out and experience these things, and then they can go back in the house and later on maybe draw a picture of what they saw or maybe they could write down something they saw. Who knows? Maybe they'll sit at the piano, and who knows what they'll come up with on the piano. It depends, you know, on what the child's instinct is. But creativity can come if if you just experience the world. Go out and enjoy what's out there instead of, you know, looking at your cell phone. I mean, <laughs> you know, it's it's so sad. It's so sad that they think that the, everything is answered. Everything is there. Well, and it's, it's definitely 
and it's not. Should and when, school- we're, when I was a little kid, which is 100 years ago, but, you know, when I was a kid, <laughs> my, you know, I could go out for the day and climb trees or go down to the beach or hang out with other people and even climb over walls to sneak in on somebody's garden. I did all kinds of naughty things, but my mother never knew what I was doing. <laughs> but, you know, we were outside. It was it, it wasn't a question of having a cell phone. It wasn't a question of looking at TV. It was a question of going out and just experiencing the heat or the cold or whatever, you know, just go out and experience what's out there. And that's what these kids today need to do. Wow. So true. Well, do you think... And they also need to listen to music. They, you know, very often, you know, like uh, the two hemispheres of the brain can come together if you put classical music in the background. That's the laughing off. Uh, he discovered that. He moved to Switzerland and they have a whole institute about bringing the two hemispheres of the brain together with classical music. But, uh, I mean, that's another idea is to play classical music and then ask your 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 daughter or your son to maybe write something down with that in the background. Interesting. See what Did, they come sh- up with. Should schools pay greater attention to creativity? Cause, Absolutely, and that's what that's what Joe Biden wrote about. That's what his quote is about. You know, bringing it back so the kids can recognize something they didn't even know they had. Mm-hmm. Creativity is essential. I mean, if it wasn't for mathematics, you wouldn't have music. You know, so if you have music in the school. Well, that will enhance your desire to learn mathematics. And the Greek word for mathematics was mathema, which means what is known. <laughs> you always surprise me when you talk about the etymology of words. <laughs> when you, and, and for those who are listening, etymology of words simply means you go back to the dictionary and see where, what are the roots of a particular word. I know one word that I loved when I discovered what it really meant in its pieces was the word conversation because I always thought it was well it's you know you have two people talking together but it isn't it comes from con and versa and it really means to turn around together and it suddenly was a totally new comprehension in my mind as to what a conversation really was that you turn around uh-huh. together yeah right what's what are some of your favorite words well, that reveal you've... remove the veil Ray Valari, to remove the veil. So I saw uh, De Frau und Schatten, which is a, an opera, and I saw that up in San Francisco at one point, and, and they had these veils between the audience and the singer of the opera, and as the, as the opera progressed, the veils would be lifted one by one until at the end of the opera there was no veil. So it was revealed. It took the word reveal and put it on the stage. <laughs> ah, remove the veil. Remove the veil. That's great. Uh, Let me come back to, we talked about schools. What do you think we lose as a society if creativity is lessened? Well, we probably lose making any advance in anything because I, I told you about the Einstein thing, you know, it's because of his having that dream that he came up with relativity. And if you remove creativity, you know, I, you can't remove it. I, I don't think it's possible to totally remove it, but it can be enhanced in the schools. You can't totally remove creativity because people are always going to, to, to draw. People are always going to play music and people are always going to, to write. But you can't totally remove it. But I certainly think the schools need to enhance um, creativity by having art classes and, and even drama. It's fun having drama. We used to do that in La Jolla when I was a kid. We got on stage and performed. It was great fun. Yeah, I did that when I was in high school, too. I, I, I hope they continue to do it, but I, I don't know if they do. But I know that I played, I'll never forget one time, they cast me as a queen. And, and, the, Whoa. <laughs> and, the teacher, and the teacher, as I was delivering the lines, he looked at me and he says, Ah, I think we have found your role. (laughs) (laughs) You never forgot, did you? (laughs) I didn't. It was such a surprise. I mean, it was a teenager. Okay, Your Majesty. Yeah. (laughs) You know, as a teenager, you you really are struggling with who am I? What am I? I mean, that's what teenage years are all about, is 
discovering those pieces. So uh, that was really quite funny. He says, I enjoy enjoy writing. writing. I was a teenager, you know, writing was my way of of discovering and meeting and and getting to know not only me, but getting to know me through knowing other people and experiencing their thoughts by interviewing them. By interviewing. Uh, You know, interviewing is a a magical way to, to, uh, to learn. Uh, for my books, of course, I always begin with interviewing people. And and it's funny because I'll start with an idea of what I'm going to write about. And after I've interviewed 10, 20 people, I go, oh, now, Madeline, this is really what you should be writing about. And it's and it's because they have <laughs> new insights. Does that happen to you? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, you know... I, I was thinking about. Uh, I, I, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I just wanted to mention one other thing. Well, the, you know, since the I, the arts are being pushed aside, you know, that's what we're talking about taking out of the art, taking the arts out of the school, and they're becoming less significant. And science is taught as a way to have children think that for every question there's an answer, and that's that's the main reason that you want to get the creativity back because there aren't. There aren't necessarily answers. There are more questions, and one question leads to another question and leads to another question, and it opens your mind to new ideas and new direction. And it just, I don't know, it just makes what you're learning in school a little bit more significant. Does that make sense? Oh, yes, because, you know, when you when your mind asks a question, it's it stands ready for an answer. And, and as a, a student... That's the, I call it that, that's the learning moment. So that if you ask that question and then you pursue it, you're going to remember what comes to you because you are focused on it. Uh, that's why in, in, in my classes, when I tell students, you ask the questions you need to ask because those are learning moments for you. Whether I can answer it or not, that's not the point. The point is it's a learning moment for you because you have formulated that. And I, I also use that as an example of how we need to be thinking about simply curiosity. Uh, I loved your, your comments about if you want to build creativity, have people go into, the, into nature. And in nature, you've, there is so much stimulation that you begin to get curious as well. You know, why is a leaf green? Why is there all those colors in the rainbow? Uh, it's for, for a young child, it's, it's just like magic to go out. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think, think that's the key word, magic. I love that, magic. Well, There's a lot of magic around us, and it's okay. It's, it's exciting. And, and kids get excited by, you know, and that the excitement, we need to keep that. We need to be kids for the rest of our life. You know, you have to, I mean, even Dr. Seuss said that, you know, <laughs> we, yes. we are children all our lives. <laughs> all our lives. And, and, you know, I think sometimes it's when people think they need to be adult that they, they begin to shut things down just, and, and, and the, yet the greatest fun I have is when I can let go of all that sort of thing and just say, okay, this is what I'm going to do. This is what I'm going to say. This is the, this is the question I have in my mind. Uh, I think I, I actually give more to people when I'm that way. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Patricia, do you think there is any simple practice that anyone could do to simply spark their creativity? I think you've mentioned a lot here, but, but I want to challenge you to even more. Well, I challenged the lady to yesterday at the, at the museum about redefining what she was doing. Instead of making baskets, she's creating them. You know, I love that shift. You're not just making baskets. You're creating it. Think of all the times that you think you're making dinner when, in fact, you're creating dinner. It just occurred to me as you said yeah, that. Yeah, my husband does. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> He's a great cook. Oh, that's <laughs> and great. Very good meals, yes. <laughs> that creative that part of creativity does not exist with me, but it does with him. 
Oh, wonderful, wonderful. I I share that with my husband. We we have made the agreement that he does so many meals and I do so many meals so that we can but, we can. But the other in- part of my husband is the fact that, you know, he's a retired physician, so he's left brain. He everything is you know, you had to learn, you know, uh, so many rules and regulations in, in medicine. I mean, there's so many scientific formulas that you have to be aware of, you know, when you're a physician. But despite that, he comes up, I mean, or maybe because of that, he's able to come up with creativity in his mind's eye. He created a pergola that's absolutely gorgeous. And how did he do it? Well, he knew we needed one to give more shade to two of our magnolia trees that were getting too much light they needed a cover so he looked at this shed we had out in out in the pasture which we took down it was called the mare shed and he took it down and took the parts of the mare shed the wood and he reformulated the wood he redesigned the wood he recut it into different uh sizes and shapes and then he painted it and then he put it together and oh my goodness we have the most beautiful pergola you've ever seen and it was all in his mind's eye and that's that's creativity right there. Yes. So you don't have to be an artist to be creative. Sometimes people will say to me, but I, I feel so constrained, Madeline. And your the story about your husband is a perfect example of being creative within constraints. He had a need and he saw a pile of lumber or a, a source of lumber and that uh-huh. was the constraint. It was a true constraint. And yet within that, he was able to create something. And I think sometimes we we think that, that constraints limit us too much. And in fact, I find them to be real stimulants to say, okay, this is my constraint, but within there, what can I do? Yeah. Yeah. It, it, you, you, you open the door. You say, nope, I'm not going to go in. A, I'm not going to be in a closed room. I'm going to open the door and I'm going to go into the next room to find out what's over there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, you've said and we've talked about it to let the words take over so that your mind. Well, that's when is- you're writing. Yes. The words yes. take over very often. If you sit down, uh, you just don't people say, well, I don't know how to do this. There's not the how to do it. You sit down and you just start writing. And if you're writing a memoir, you just you can pick any time in your life. You can start in the beginning or you can start at the end or you can start wherever you want and just remember something. Write down something that you remember that took something that you did in your life. And one thing leads to another and all of a sudden, next thing you know, been three hours and you look at the screen and you say my goodness look at all the stuff I wrote I didn't know I had that the words will take over if you give them permission Ah. and beautiful it's beautiful when you read what you know and it doesn't matter if it's in order it doesn't matter if it's if it progresses from one to the other just let them scatter all over the screen in any any form you want and then later on you can put it all together but you have to release it you have to give it permission to go and be there and and let your subconscious open up it's there it's all you know if we have these little cubby holes and we keep these things inside the cubby holes and we don't want to open them well when you start writing like that all of a sudden these doors are opening in your mind and these words are flowing and these thoughts are coming and you say, oh, my gosh, I forgot that. But it was always there. It's mm. like the painting I that's on the cover of Myth, Magic, and Metaphor. The painting, uh, it shows the princess and the unicorn. And it, I was doing a plein air painting in southern France and I put the extra paint on this empty canvas and I just wiped it on with a palette knife. I used oil paint and I had all these different colors and I turned the painting sideways and upside down and oh my goodness, do you know what I saw? I saw the princess and the unicorn in the paint. I didn't plan it. They were there. Well, why were they there? Well, I guess I had seen the original tapestry in Avignon, and somewhere in my mind, it was there, and it came out in the paint, and I allowed it to be there, and that's the cover. That's the painting on the cover of my book, Myth, Magic, and Metaphor. It just came, and it's there. That's an example of 
if you give per- yourself permission, things will just come on their own. There's another painting I did where I have, I have the paint all over the canvas, and I look at it, and my goodness, I found 16 different animals hidden in that paint. <laughs> Well, you know, it goes back to that quote I gave of Twyla Tharp that that uh, all of our creativity comes from from our memories. <laughs> so even if we're not conscious of them, it's still there. It's there. Your- it's always there. You just have to give yourself permission. I mean, like the word recognize, you wanted the etymology of words, recognize is to reconnoitere, to re-know. You recognize something. Well, how do you recognize it? It's because you already knew it. That's why you recognize it. You re-know it. You already knew it. And that's what happens when you allow yourself to do this writing and just let the words take over. You already knew it. You just didn't recognize it until it went down and got on the screen of your computer or you can handwrite it if you'd prefer. You know, it'll come out and you gave yourself permission to let it happen. It's amazing what you'll find out. And that's the beauty of creativity. It just allows a person, it's a, it's a gift. It's truly a gift that we as human beings have and we really need to recognize that, reno, recognize, reconnoitere. <laughs> we have to recognize we have that gift. And that, again, getting back to the schools, you know, the arts have to come back to the schools for that very reason. And, but, but the, the thing that I really have latched onto, as you said it, is this aspect of giving permission. That it's not a question of perfection. It is a, just a question of opening up, opening up. Well, I must say, this conversation has been unbelievable, uh, Patricia. I so appreciate your time. Uh, I, I, I'm, uh, in fact, I'm still kind of speechless because I'm, my mind is just going a thousand ways, uh, just being stimulated by the the thoughts that you have given. So again, thank you so much for joining me. Would you like to give our listeners some final words? I think the final word would be to aspire to inspire before you expire. Oh, you have to say that again, Patricia. Aspire to inspire before you expire. (laughs) Oh, I love it. Indeed, that all of us should get rolling. That's right. You know, there is so much. No matter much. how old you are or how young you are, <laughs> you're always a child, actually. As, as an adult, you never lose your the child part and let it be there. That's yes. creative. That's creativity. You know, there's so yeah. much that I drew from Patricia's comments. Here are just a few. First and foremost, there are no rules. Creativity is a process, not a product. And I love this last one. You have to give yourself permission. Second, that creativity is for everyone. Just get out of the way and listen to your heart. And, I, the, and the heart comes from cure, cour in French. Yeah. No, that's courage, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, that's it. Thank yeah, you. That's courage. It takes courage to listen to your heart. Carol. Yeah. And third, that creative acts come from our memories. I have done a lot of work on helping people and organizations write their future stories. Now, without preparation, the story is always so fantastical that there's no way that anyone will believe they can be obtained. But creativity comes from our memories. And so instead of just dreams that have no foundation... I have my clients begin writing stories from their past and present before tackling the future story. It's amazing. The future story suddenly is recognizable because it has taken off from their own present world. They can recognize themselves in the story, just like you, Patricia, recognized animals in the picture. And it becomes a real inspiration. Creativity comes from our memories. Whether we consciously remember or not, our brain will call them up when needed. This is actually a reminder that we should always be looking for new and unexpected things in our lives, even when they have been in our lives for a long time. Take time to observe them 
as Patricia suggested, get out in nature because creativity comes from our memories. Well, I want to thank you for listening to this segment of Unlocked. Next week, we'll be talking with Kate O'Connell. Kate works with teens and young adults to heal feelings of trauma and discomfort. With teen suicides growing, the subject is timely. She calls it going beyond the imprint. Listen in next week and learn what she means by going beyond the imprint. I hope you will join us. You've been listening to Unlocked, brought to you live from Bold Brave Media Talk Network and TuneIn Radio. Archives are available also on Spotify, iTunes, iHeart. Our hashtag is Unlocked Possibilities, one word. This is Madeline Blair, wishing you infinite possibilities as you unlock your resilience. You've been listening to Unlocked with host Madeline Blair. If you're feeling overwhelmed with anxiety caused by the issues of our day, tune in each week as Madeline presents strategies that can help you take action that will benefit you, your family, or in business. Right here on Madeline Blair's Unlocked. You've been listening to the BBM Global Network. The ideas, views, and opinions of this broadcast are those of the participants of the program and are not necessarily the ideas, views, and opinions of the BBM Global Network Company.